we've got a lot to praise God for. Can you believe Easter is five weeks away? Wow. Five weeks away. Daylight they like saving time starts in two weeks. It starts in that extra hour of sleep, if you don't mind. Uh, next week is going to be a big time for this church. We're going to be voting to approve Casey Groves as our next senior pastor. Anybody for that? Yeah. We invite you to hang around after the service today. We're going to have a celebration of life. You're sharing your voice. And then there's going to be a barbecue afterwards. So make sure and hang around for that. It's going to be a great time to be together. Uh, this morning we have a real privilege. We're going to get to hear some missionaries from Albania. Who knows a country that is near Albania? Let's see how well you know Albania here. Anybody know a country that's near Albania? <laughs> Kosovo. 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 There's one. Croatia, okay. Greece. Greece is the one I found there, okay. Greece. So we're going to have them share. It's going to be an exciting time. Corey and Christine Kramer. Uh, Christine is the sister of Amy Tokemeyer, who is the wife of Jack Tokemeyer, who is the son of Eric Tokemeyer. So you know where this all fits in. But uh, it's been my privilege this week to get to know them. They just got a great story. I, I just would say one thing as you watch the slides and things, so they didn't plan a church in Albania that has a lot of young adults. I was impressed with the number of young adults. Often when you're starting churches, it's the older generation, they know how, and you don't, don't have anything left. But these, a lot of younger adults. So give them a warm welcome. Come on up. Here we guys. Well, good morning. We could just have a quick geography lesson. I think that's, uh, <laughs> Albania is, uh, you know, this small, country that's been forgotten, but we are, we're really thankful to be here. We don't know you and you don't know us, but we're really here to encourage you this morning uh, for what God has done in Albania. And it's a place that uh, we love and God has brought us there and just a really cool story. So we're hoping this morning that we can share our story briefly. Uh, this is, I, I mean, I think I have a better picture. Uh, this is our our firstborn child the day we moved to Albania, and that was all we owned was in the back of that truck. And I remember, now we have four kids. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah so uh, we've gone through big change real quick. It's been a blast. We uh, arrived to Albania, and let's just learn about Albania. Yes. Yeah. So here's some things about Albania for those of you that don't know. Uh, there's three million people there, so it's a small country. It's a forgotten country, right? Nobody really knows where it is. And uh, it's impoverished. So it's uh, not very similar to the countries that surround it. It, that, it doesn't feel European, uh, mostly because it's 70% Muslim. So this is nominal Islam. They're not necessarily practicing Muslims, but they would all claim, 70% would claim to be Islam. But what really drew our hearts to Albania is that less than 1% of Albania knows Christ. And that actually is uh, like one per it's much less than 1%, not even close. So there are no Christians in this country because they were under communism for a really long time. And before that, they were uh, under the Byzantine Empire, so they were Muslim. So they went from Islam to communism. And under communism, they were the first atheistic nation in the world. So they claimed that their uh, country religion was atheism. So there's no religion, no Christianity, no Bibles, no nothing. You couldn't name your children a name from the Bible. Uh, so it is. This is what we went into. Uh, communism has since fallen, but you see the effects of that all everywhere you go in the country. So when we moved there to plant a church, this was the first environment we found ourselves in was this small room we rented and after doing a bunch of outreach to young people we had this little youth group and I know it is it looks cute uh, but in reality these are unsaved like smoking swearing fighting youth that are there because they're they're curious why are you teaching us about the Bible they've never seen one before they've never heard the gospel and so it's just an exciting time to to share Christ with these young people. So we began to do Bible studies, and I had the boys, and Christina had the girls, and we were with a, a, a team of Albanians as well, and we're just doing ministry, and God really blessed that. We watched young people get saved, and because of the change in their own life, their parents were saying, you know, what did you do to my kid? Because um, <laughs> they're, they're acting different. And so they began to learn about the Bible. And so we began to uh, meet as a church, and uh, slowly we outgrew this building 
and we had to move to a larger building. We outgrew that one, and we did that two more times. And we realized we uh, we have a problem. We keep, and it's a good problem. We keep outgrowing our space because more people are wanting to learn about Christ. So God gave us this incredible place, and and we highlight it in green so you see that this is the center of our city. And uh, next to it is the the town hall, the courthouse. And in the center of the city is this property that no one wanted. And we began to pray and ask God if he would give us this building. And it was remodeled. And uh, he did give us that. And in March 2019, this is the first Sunday we had there. And it was just an amazing blessing. In addition to the, the church building on this property, we wanted to think of a way that we could make the church uh, self-sufficient and financially stable. Because like I said, it is an impoverished country, and by the support we were raising, we were paying uh, for the rent of the previous buildings, or for the electric bills, or for uh, the supplies we need for children's ministry. And uh, we wanted to think of a way that the church could be financially stable if I mean, we, we want to be there as long as God allows, but if something were to happen uh, to us or to the people that we work with and we weren't there anymore, how could the church continue? So we use part of the property to create these businesses. Uh, there's a coffee shop, uh, which is which works amazing in Albania because all they, all they do is drink coffee. Uh, it is, they consume the highest uh, amount of coffee per capita in the world. So they are they are drinking coffee right now. It's probably midnight, but that's what they're doing. Uh, so we have the coffee shop, a little hotel, and a bakery. And through that, we've been able to employ 18 people from our church uh, whose families are struggling. They now have full-time jobs. And the proceeds of these businesses go into the church. So those businesses are now supporting uh, the the church through paying for the bills and through all these things. So this was really exciting to us. It was kind of an idea that uh, the Lord blessed and we kind of looked at ourselves and thought like, wow, this, it worked. Uh, so this was two years ago and it's been going well since then and we're so thankful. And it's, it's really been something that has really impacted our city because everyone's saying, what is this? Uh, and, I, and I want to show you this picture as well because this is what's happening inside the building. These are, uh, we have multiple Bible studies, services for youth and children, and our worship services. We're raising up leaders, a soup kitchen, and, and feeding people, which actually in the last season with coronavirus has been a tremendous outreach to people. So we just have been so blessed to watch God do this. And as we, you know, stop and take a breath, because it's been a wild six and a half years, we say, what, what's our focus now? And uh, we are praying that we can continue to Focus on evangelism. Still, Albania, less than 1%, no price. And that weighs on us daily. That, that motivates us daily. And we can also not do this without help. So we are praying that God would quickly train up pastors uh, and, and bring missionaries to Albania. It's a place of great need. And so I want to share just a story about this young man. Mario, we met when we first moved there. And he was... Uh, Muslim, and he was a Muslim that actually went to the, the mosque and actually was learning the Quran in Arab. Like, he can still sing some Arabic songs. So, uh, we met him, and he was really curious. He jumped in a Bible study with me, and we went through the Book of Romans, like, verse by verse. And for an Albanian, that is something very, very rare and strange. And I watched this young man slowly understand what Christ had done for him, and slowly being transformed, and, and not not just being transformed for himself, but wanting to impact others. And Mario now uh, has become a different person. He leads uh, Bible studies for junior high boys. He manages the bakery and, and is, is on his way to becoming a leader in our church in so many ways. And this is a man who, as, as, a, as a child, was raised believing the way to salvation was through the Islamic faith. And that's something that when we stop and say, Okay, this is super hard. We're exhausted. Is it worth it? We keep saying, well, there's Mario. You know, he really is an encouragement to us about seeing a, a life changed. And uh, this is Messina. Um, I think when we, when we even look at these pictures and remember uh, the church back home, it's easy to see all the faces and just be amazed at, at the growth that's taken place. But uh, we also remember that it really has been one person at a time and one outreach at a time, and one, 
one soul being saved by Christ at a time. And this girl, Messina, uh, we met the first summer we were there. I had a baby. I couldn't go to camp. And someone brought her to my house. And uh, she, had, she had been hurting herself. The girl in an abusive home. Her dad was an alcoholic, like, like many there. Um, and was just sobbing at my kitchen table, uh, truly lost. And uh, we watched that girl go from someone who had never heard about Jesus and now uh, she is actually helping with another church plant. So now seven years later, she's in another city helping plant a church there. <clears throat> that dad that initially yelled at her uh, when I took her home that night and yelled at me. I, was, I had no idea what he was saying. We'd only been there a month, and I was like, i got to leave. Uh, but he now comes to church every Sunday, her dad, and comes early and sits in the front. And, and sings to God and reads his Bible at home. And so what we've truly seen is uh, through these students we saved, it is, it's changed their families. It's changed in many ways at different neighborhoods in our city. And uh, we, we do truly believe that this is a time in Albania that, that, that the Lord is, is working. And uh, we feel very privileged to be a part of it because of people like Mario and Messina. Yeah, yeah amen. Um, all this to say, we, I know that in the last, you know, 16 months or a year, we've all learned to count our blessings, right? About the, the strange things that God has done through a pandemic and the, the way the church has grown. And I'm sure you've seen your own church grow. We want you to know that God is also growing the church in places like Albania. And I hope that's a huge encouragement to you this morning. So we're, we're happy to be here, and we would just love to share more of these stories and more of what God is doing. So we're going to be out on the patio, and we'd just love to meet you guys this morning. So thank you so much for letting us stop through, and uh, we just pray it's a blessing to you to know that God's still working in great ways. Thank you. It's beautiful out today. We're going to celebrate Sharon after church, if you can stick around. Um, driving over, I, I never I never tire looking at the beauty in this valley. And, you know, King David talked a lot about nature, and that's one of the ways he connected with God. So, it's a beautiful day. Let's sing about his beauty today. Oh Lord, you're beautiful.
If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would speak through my mouth as I preach your word. I pray that I would be your mouthpiece. I pray that as we meditate upon your word, that it would be pleasing to you, God. That you would be brought glory, the glory and honor that you are due. We love you. Amen. John, a disciple of Jesus, he was, he was actually Jesus' best friend. He was one of the only disciples that was not martyred. He actually died of old age, although he was in exile on the island of Patmos. He gives us a message, and this is toward the end of his life. He's, he's an older man here. He's getting close to the end, and he knows that he has to boil down the message of the gospel to its most clearest message. And so this is what he says. This is the message. I've seen Jesus with my own eyes. I've heard him with my own ears. I've touched him. I've camped out with Jesus. I've eaten with Jesus. I spent a good portion of my life with Jesus. And now I proclaim the message about him to you. Here it is. God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. This is the message. God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. And so, at the very base of the gospel message, the truth about Jesus, which the gospel is that all of us have sinned, we've all fallen short of God's perfection and glory, and the payment for that sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, who came and bore our sins on the cross. And if you trust in him, if you believe that Jesus is your sin bearer, he gives you the right to be called a son and daughter of God. He gives you righteousness. He takes your sin upon himself and he exchanges righteousness, a right relationship with God. This is the good news about the gospel. Um, I want BCF to be a place where anybody who is in this room, I can point to you, which I won't do this morning, and say, what is the gospel? And for you to stand up and say, the gospel is and exactly what I just said. I would love for everyone to know the gospel so crystal clear that when you are in any situation, when you, you are near someone, you are so excited to share the gospel that the people that you're around actually want to know what the hope that is that's inside of you. Why do you live the way that you live? The reason why John says the message is, is boiled down to this, God is light and in him there is no darkness, is because you and I live in a world of darkness. We live in a deep, dark world. And... As the Bible calls it, first fruits, Jesus, the first one to do this, brought light into the darkness. The Gospel of John says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word, was Jesus, brought the light to men and the life to men. Jesus is both life and light. He brings light to the darkness and life to the dead. You and I, if we claim to have fellowship with that light, you will also be light in a dark place. So this is why John says, this is the message. This is the simplicity of the message of the gospel and the message that I want to give to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. What does it mean, though, that God is light? God is light. Let's think about light for a second. What does light do? Well, light exposes things that are in the dark. Um, when I was a kid, uh, one of my biggest fears was E.T. <laughs> I don't know if you know who E.T. You know, extraterrestrial. He's, a, he's an alien. Steven Spielberg's imagination, brilliant, absolutely terrifying too. Uh, ten. Yeah, I was ten. So uh, when I was a kid, I was terrified of the dark, and I had this routine. I, I would wake up in the night and be like, Oh no, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, I have to go downstairs in the darkness. So what I would do, we left our hall light on every night, so I would, I would wander down the stairs, and I had this routine. 
I would go down the stairs, and from the light of the hallway, I could turn on the piano light. And from the piano light, I could go around and I could turn on the kitchen light. And from the kitchen light, I could go to the bathroom and turn on the bathroom light. And then I would go to the bathroom. But then I had to shut all the lights off. <laughs> so, as fast as I could run, I shut off the bathroom light, shut off the kitchen light, shut off the piano light, and run up the stairs every night because I was afraid that E.T. was back there. <laughs> Which is funny, because if you've ever seen the movie, he kind of moves like this, and he's not that fast. <laughs> I was terrified of the darkness because of what the darkness does to people. Darkness makes it so that you don't know what's there, and what happens is you become afraid because of what you don't know. This is why crime happens in dark alleys. This is why most evil happens in the night. Darkness veils what is there so that you don't know the truth about it. But light exposes the darkness so, you, so that you can see what's really there and have no fear. God has come into the world to bring that light to expose not just those people's darkness out there, but to expose the darkness within your own heart. God has come. Jesus has come to you. To say, you have darkness in your heart, and the light must reveal the darkness to you so that you can do something that I want to make the main point for this morning. And if you forget everything else I've said this morning, please remember this. Repentance and confession is the key to a relationship with God. Amen. Repentance and confession is the key to a relationship with God. One of the biggest troubles with church today, the modern church today, and one of the reasons why so many of people my age, millennials, are walking away from the church is because they look at the church, and I've heard this time and time again, over and over again, people will say, the church is filled with hypocrites. The church is filled with hypocrites that, that say one thing and they do another John's about to tell us that if you're truly a Christian, that the mark of a true Christian is someone who recognizes the darkness inside of them and agrees with God about their sin. That's what confession and repentance means. It means that you see the sin in your life because God has exposed it through the gospel and you agree with God about your sin. You say, yes, this is, this is true of me. I need his salvation. Uh, this is a one-off. I had this thought. I was having this thought this morning as I was charging my phone. Um, I find it very interesting that uh, when we're holding our phones, there's a light that's shining in our face, but from that light comes some of the darkest, most evil things in the world. You know, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And we need to be able to, to distinguish between the true light, the light of salvation, and false light. This light of the world. This uh, special knowledge that claims to give you what you need. John says, no, the only light has no darkness in it at all. And that light is Jesus. It says this, verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, who are we lying to? We're, we're lying to other people. And this is what I mean by this problem with the church being filled with hypocrites. Church is not supposed to be a place where we proclaim about ourselves, this is how you should live. Come to church, because it's filled with people who are all doing the right thing all the time. And if you're kind of messed up, Clean yourself up a little bit. Make sure you say the right things, do the right things, wear the right things. Then you can come into church and you can worship God alongside of us. Now, that is not what church is. Church is a place that should be filled with broken people who recognize their need for a Savior. So you come to church and you realize, this darkness inside of me, God, through Jesus has made a way so that I can be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. But it's not for me, not by anything I have done, but because of Christ and what Christ has done for me. The reason I can claim to walk in the light as he is in the light is because I confess that, and I agree with God about my sin. 
I haven't saved myself from my sin. I haven't cleaned myself up to make myself righteous. Jesus has done that in me and through me. And the light that shines out from me is not my own light. It's Jesus' light through me. John says, this is what it means to be a Christian. That you recognize your need for a Savior and you live in repentance. John would put it this way in Matthew chapter 2, verse 8. He says, I'm sorry, Matthew 3, 8. He says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That, that means that your life should look like Jesus' is. The way that you talk sounds like Jesus. The way that you live looks like Jesus. You are bearing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. So he says, if you, if you don't live that way, if you say, I, I am a, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ, but the way that you live doesn't look like Jesus at all. You look like the world. And he says, don't, don't fool other people. Don't lie to other people. And again, he says, the way to live is to live with repentance and confession. And the reason I, I know that is because verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. That's the result of living that way. Living in a way where you confess and repent as a continual lifestyle. I have to make a clear distinction here, actually. I'm not talking about your salvation when I talk about living a life of confession and repentance. You don't confess and repent so that you will receive salvation. When you became a believer, your standing before God is righteous. But there, there's this fine line between you are a child of God, that's your identity, you are saved, you're rescued, and you are lost. You are, you are not God's. And the line right here, when you bump into it, is defined by if you're going to repent of living like the world or not. It's like there's this, this line, and the closer you get to it, the more like the world you look. Because there are definitely some believers that throughout their life, they really struggle and they bump up against this line. They have a, a besetting sin that just seems to constantly trip them up. But every time they bump up against this line, they remember who they are in Christ. I was bought with a price by Christ's blood and this is my identity. I confess my sins. I repent. And this is who I am. People who don't do that and continuously live a life of sin it's a habitual pattern and lifestyle. John says, you're, you're trying to fool everybody. You're saying you're a Christian, but you live over here. That's not how that works. Um, when I was in sixth grade, I uh, was playing basketball with some friends. And we had this kid in our class. His name was, well, actually, his name was Robin, but we called him Bobber. <laughs> and uh, it was because he always wore red sweatpants and a white shirt. Anyway, so Bobber, he, 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 was, uh, he was pretty hilarious, and we, uh, we all kind of made fun of him, but he was also kind of a bully. He was just kind of a mean kid who just loved to rile people up. He just loved to get a rise up, anybody he could. Well, my whole class knew that I was a Christian. Now, we had a big class of about 19 people uh, in a you know, small town, around the town 300 people. Anyway, so Bobber knew I was a Christian, and so did everybody else playing basketball there, you know, when I was in sixth grade. And I had a good friend named Drew. Drew was a believer, and uh, he was in fifth grade, and we were all playing basketball together, and Drew was really good, me not so much. So I tried to do a layup, and Bobber just hacked me. I mean, like, <laughs> boom, like, obvious foul, it made me angry, and I went up to him, and I pushed him, and I, some, some crazy things came out of my mouth. <laughs> and I pushed him. The game stopped. Everybody looked at me like this. And, and Bobber came over and he's like, Yeah! Why was he excited? Why was he saying, Welcome to the family? It's because suddenly, the words that came out of my mouth and my behavior reflected darkness. And I looked over and I looked at my friend Drew, and I'll never forget his face. He went like this. 
Like, who are you? Have you forgotten your identity? Now, as we become adults, we do things similarly, but sometimes much deeper and much darker. And we forget our identity in Christ. We don't, we don't want to try to lie to other people if that's not who we really are, if we're, if we're living over here. But if, that's, if you are a child of God and your identity is in Christ, and you bump up against that line, John says, confess your sins. God really loves you. He's faithful. He's just. He will forgive your sins. And you will have fellowship with other believers. There's another claim here, once we get to verse 8. And the claim is this. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Again, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and will purify us from all unrighteousness. So here's another claim. We claim to be without sin. And that's, that looks like this. Um, I actually, no, uh, I, I don't need to confess and repent. I, I did that at uh, Hume Lake when I was 15. Uh, no, no, I don't need to confess and repent my sin, of my sins today because, because I'm saved. I'm saved, and, and once you're saved, you're always saved. And, and so then I, I have this uh, shiny license to sin, uh, you know, Romans 6. It's, uh, right? Or wait, oh, Romans 6 means I can't live that way. You see the conflict? It's, it's this idea that you're resting your salvation on things that happened a long time ago. I prayed this prayer. Once I get a lot of money to missionaries, I go to church every Sunday. I send my kids to church. You're resting your identity on things that you, you're doing that are external. And once you uh, get to that line, you're not really sure which side you're on. And it's confusing because... If you claim to be without sin, you deceive who? Yourself. So you're not even sure what you believe about yourself. It's confusing. Because you find yourself, you feel like you're kind of living over there. And didn't I pray that prayer once? And didn't I get missionary and marry some, some money once? And, and don't I go to church every Sunday? But you live over here. What you're doing is you're deceiving yourself into thinking that your status is righteous. But again, what does John say? He says, the way out of that is look at your identity, examine yourself, and see if you really are a believer by bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. It's the same thing as he said before. He said that the path to walk in the light as he is in the light is you expose those deeds of darkness through the word of God and through those convictions, you confess and you repent so that you can look like Jesus. The third claim is a little bit scary. Verse 10 says, if we claim we have not sinned, then who's lying? Who do you think is, is lying? It, it's, if we claim that we have not sinned, we make God out to be the liar. And his word has no place in our lives. This is a really scary place to be. And this is the equivalent of saying, I don't need God's forgiveness. I, I don't need to confess. I don't need to repent. I don't need Jesus' blood to rescue me from, from sin. I don't need him. God is lying about the darkness that's in me. The Bible tells us that the vast majority of people in the world live in this camp. They live here. They're completely blind and deaf to the truth about their sin. And what they need is the light of the gospel to come into their life. What they need to see is someone who's living in the light as he is in the light and living a life of consistent repentance, not thinking that this person's superhuman, they're, just, they're holy. They're hovering above the ground. No, they're, they're a normal human being who makes mistakes all the time, who recognizes that those mistakes are not their identity, and that they need to come to Christ and confess and repent and bear fruit. Amen. People need to see that. People need to see that our, that our church is not filled with people who are holier than thou, but that we worship the one who he alone is holy. 
That we worship Him because when we sin, He doesn't leave us in the darkness. He reaches in and He is gentle with us and He's kind to us. He's faithful and He's just. And He will forgive us our sins and clothe us again. Clothe us with His righteousness. God deeply loves you. And He says that the path to walk in the light, because He's in the light, starts and ends with a life of agreeing with God about your sin. You agree with God. First for your salvation, Jesus, I need you to rescue me from my sin. And when he rescues you from from your sin and brings you into the glorious kingdom of his light, and you live there, anytime that you bump against that line, you can be reminded, that is not who I am in Christ. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are more than conquerors because of Christ in you. You have a new identity. You are a new creation. God has given to you and me this identity to live out. And we find it right here. We find the formula. It's very straightforward. And John gives it to us at the end of his age in a very simple way so that we can live in the light as he is in the light. Let's live in the light. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you that it's so simple. Uh, but Lord, we know that it's, not, that it's not simple to live this way. We know that it's very difficult to live this way. That it means that we have to humble ourselves. It means that we have to come to you and confess our sins. It means that we have to go to other people. Lord, I pray that you would help us in our weakness to recognize the areas in our heart we need to surrender to you. Lord, one of the most difficult things is to go to other people, to other believers, people that we have wronged, and confess our sin to them. To go to people we trust, our mentors, people who are discipling us, and simply be transparent, open, and honest about the sin in our life so that we can confess and repent and live a life of holiness that you have called us to. Father, uh, we need your grace. We need you, God, to change our hearts, change our minds. We offer our body to you as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing, that we might live a life of love, led by the light of Christ. We love you, God. We pray these things in your precious name. Um, we don't have to take down the chairs right now. We're going to leave them up for Sharon's uh, celebration of life service. So have a blessed Sunday.